Um, is, uh, I'm just interested in, in the rental store strategy. Is Cat being more aggressive in pursuing his rental store strategy? Um, is it pushing dealers to get involved with rental? Is that going to become obligatory? Well, it already is. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't say it's obligatory. Every single one of our dealers has a huge rental fleet and rental store option today. Uh, what, what we need to do and work on is how we, how our de how we go to the rental market with our dealers for customers especially that cross territory so they get the same look and feel. Mm -hmm. But today every dealer in, the, in every, all 180 dealers in our system today have a huge rental asset that, that they're already involved with. And it's working pretty well. Yeah, Ed, you want to? Yeah, you know, I think at the end of the day, it's what are the customer requirements? Mm -hmm. And you know, customer requirement, you know, rental. Like as we've gone through the cycles, as we've had some uncertainty relative to economic growth, it's very normal I think, for a customer base to turn to a more flexible asset. Rental is one of them. So our dealers have got to be in a position to serve that. Mm -hmm. you know, the question is, is how do we drive? common best practices across that global dealer network to raise the level of performance because rentals here to stay. Yeah, right. so. If rental uh, becomes in the long term a bigger part of the overall business, this is not just a, if it's not just a cyclical thing, is that good for you or bad for you? Both. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm and, I, and I say that uh, uh, a little bit tongue in cheek, but we are the biggest rental store, rental equipment supplier in the world today when we aggregate all of our dealers. So we should be the ones that really get the benefit out of that. The, the pressure though that that puts on the collective dealers and us financially is why I kind of answer that both ways because as, as our contractors, customers push the asset up to us, it, push, it moves the financial pressure from the customer to the dealer and then ultimately to us and we just have to figure out how to deal with that. We've had good luck with that so far. But we ought to be in a position to really take advantage of that because we're the biggest player in the industry. This uh, business of trying to raise the game of uh, the dealers to the, the highest level, uh, does that mean you'll be eliminating some dealers who can't make improvements, some of the laggards? Yeah, we, th that would really be our last and, and absolutely undesired outcome. Uh, all of our efforts with dealers through the years has been to improve their performance. And we have seldom have had a situation where a dealer just either doesn't want to do it or can't do it. So I am reasonably optimistic that once we present this business case to them where, he, look, here's nine eighteen billion dollars in your territory and we will show them by territory, by dealer, what that's worth. They've always performed. Now, will we get to that at some point? We might, but I would say that would be the last resort, the last outcome, and certainly not desirable. That's the stick you were talking about, but I, I just see we, we've never really had to use a stick. We have in the past and we will in the future, but I just don't see that as the, we're not coming out of the blocks with that, because there's just so much opportunity that they want. These are entrepreneurs. The, the, other, the other part I think was key in credibility with the dealer organization is we had the debate back in 2010 about pushing this issue of raising the bar on the dealer organization. And what we decided yeah. is we needed to raise our own bar first. Uh, we needed to improve product quality, product availability, management of the cost structure. You just go through the list that Doug walked through earlier. Because we just felt there was a lot more credibility talking to the dealer organization about the need to raise performance after we demonstrated that capability ourselves. And I think that, that gained credibility with the dealer organization that, hey, Cat's not asking us to do anything that they're not willing to do themselves. And I, you know, I think it gave us credibility with the dealer organization. Are there any dealer, uh, any, any um, particular regions that are standouts in terms of, uh, as, as, and, and models as you guys are trying to raise the bar? You know, it's, that's a great question. We have examples of big dealers that are super, small dealers that are super, Developed oil, developed, developing, undeveloped. There's, we, we just, we cannot come up with a rational explanation of put these four things in and you get out what we want. Every territory is so different. The country of France versus the country of Germany. And it really comes back to individual territories, which is, what, which is how we'll have to administer it. So as you guys are doing, are you putting folks from Peoria, uh, are you sort of deploying them out to the, you've only got 174 dealers, so it only takes 174 people. We already do. Really? Yeah, we have, a, we have a fuel force worldwide mm -hmm. that's out there today. In, in China, it's all Chinese. In Latin America, it's mostly Latins, uh, native speakers in the language. 
that have been, some have been new to CAT, some have been long-term to CAT, but I was a field rep, Ed was a field rep. Yeah. Just about everybody at CAT's been a field rep one time or another, and they are out there today. We're now harnessing the resources on this, what we call across the table initiative. So our field force is working the strategy. We want them to work with the dealers. But that this is that's nothing new. We'll probably have to bolster that a bit, but that's what we've always done. You mentioned uh, in China that you are now number one in excavators. Mm -hmm. Is that ahead of Saini now? Mm -hmm. yeah. In terms of uh, the way, you know, the excavator class, if you would, small, medium, and large excavators, uh, that, that size class. Um, and, you know, it doesn't include minis uh, where we wouldn't be as in strong position, but on the core part of what we call EXD, that size class, um, in terms of our, you know, market share, yeah, it's an industry leader. Now, I know that you, uh, you talked a long time about how your, your performance in China would improve as you, you know, executed your long-term strategy, uh, but it, was there anything else that accounts for this improvement? I mean, some tweaks you made that... I, I say a, a couple things, you know, and it gets back to the systematic build out of the business model. You know, number one was we put the manufacturing footprint in place, not only on assembly, test, and paint, but also components. You know, as I mentioned, you know, it comes as a surprise, but our local content, the percent of the material in some of our high volume excavators is higher than some of the local Chinese. Hmm. So our ability to, you know, supplier integration, build out our component engine, hydraulics, engine, hydraulics you did, uh, transmissions down the list. So one, we, we've been able to really drive that issue, which puts us in a very competitive cost position. Second is we've continued to launch product Back to what I talked about, uh, targeted customer economics and how they make money. You know, the, the GC lineup of product is an example. That, that's hitting a market segment in, in China that we weren't addressing. And so as we've developed that product, it's improved our position. Which product? Uh, you know, we've uh, launched the 950 GC, the 312 GC, <coughs> the 320 GC. Very focused at the high volume, uh, you know, uh, segments in China. The third that, that's really played out has been as, as the industry in you know, late 2012 and 2013 declined in China, a, an area where our business model just excelled is in our ability to understand how you finance equipment. Uh, you know, a lot of our local uh, China competitors, you know, put stuff out on financing, um, perhaps didn't have the same discipline about down payments and management of receivables in those kinds of areas. And a lot of our competitors have been very heavy on bad debt and receivables. The other thing that's been exposed in that whole shift is the fact that the used equipment value is not what it is on a piece of CAD equipment. And so I think another contributor, you take our business model, you know, the cost of our product, product that meets local market requirements, you know, combined with this financing, uh, and then and, and also our dealers continuing to build out their coverage combination of those things are what I think has really put us in a position to win. Was it also partly changes in management personnel in China? Yeah, I don't think it was a, a degree of changes of management. One thing that I talked about, though, is our focus on local leadership. One, one of the guys here is a guy named Chi Hua Chen. He runs China Operations. He, you know, I, I always describe him as a great leader who just happens to be Chinese. And I think what we've done in China is we've clearly articulated what we want but we've got a local team on the ground in China that is executing that business day in and day out. You know, executing the manufacturing footprint, the, you know, the component footprint, ex executing our CAT finance, you know, subsidiary, executing our product development programs. And, and I think it's been empowering that on the ground team uh, of very engaged employees. Our, our employee engagement numbers in China I mean, it's an engaged group of employees who really do, you know, believe. And I think it's been unleashing that to, to really go out and, and perform. That's, that's, that's really helped. I'll just, I'll just make one comment. I, I think this is uh, maybe uh, an odd way to say this, but in China, we truly are Chinese. In fact, we are, in some ways, more Chinese than the Chinese competitors, you know, in terms of, as Ed said earlier, content, our people, our facilities. You know, it's not as though we're trying to uh, uh, win market share in China with, uh, you know, an excavator produced in Belgium or South America or North America. Uh -huh. We are Chinese in China.
You'll see and, it, and we are not, excuse me, we are not a huge exporter from China. Yeah. You know, we are, we are still importing uh, tremendous amounts from the U.S. in the mining business into China. I think the Chinese like that. We built a business there to serve China and bring technology there. We've not done it to exploit uh, either low labor costs like others have or exploit the market. We're there for the long term. You have a joint venture in China as well with um, SEM. And I uh, no, they're a, they're a wholly owned subsidiary. Oh, it's okay. not a joint oh, venture. It's not a joint venture. Well, all of our joint ventures are wholly, well, all of our operations are, are wholly owned for exception of a couple very small yeah. components. Right, excuse me. But, I just yeah. wondered how uh, you're producing machines for the local market in China and you also have this wholly owned wholly owned subsidiary SEM. Mm -hmm. Is there a tension there? And also, is there ex any plans to expand that partnership outside of China? If you look at SEM, you know, I, I talked about kind of at a high level the way we think about customer segments being life cycle performance, life cycle value, and then more of a utility play. The utility customer in China would like, you know, productivity, and he'd like uptime, and he'd like dealer support and all the other things. He just doesn't want to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And in that pure price play, uh, that's where we go to market with the SEM mm -hmm. brand. And, you know, our you know, hypothesis all along has been as the economy continues to, to develop and grow, more of that customer base will migrate up to life cycle value, life cycle performance. And, and I think it's one of the things we're starting to see. We, we talked earlier about why market share gains in China. We haven't yet seen consolidation of manufacturers in China. Mm -hmm. If you look at the provincial structure and how each of them is kind of a local provincial champion, I think that retards some of the natural consolidation you'd see. But we have started to see consolidation within the customer base. As they went through the significant downturn, it, it's just a natural that you would see certain smaller customers you know, go out of business that you would see it consolidated into larger customers. And as the, those customers grow, they become more sophisticated in terms of how they make money. And in, in our business, you make money when the machine's out of money. I, I can and remember I so well our business model. 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when we started on this fairly aggressive expansion of our footprint in China. And one of the great debates was always hmm. low end, low cost equipment or uh, value equipment like Caterpillar that drives low owning and operating costs and when would that happen? It was not it was a question of when, not if. And I think that the slowdown in the last two years has really hastened the time that that, that customer need for productivity has come to our business model. And I, I don't think any of us would have guessed ten years ago that in 2013-14 we'd see the kind of productivity needs calling on us that we, said we, we would have all said it would take it a lot longer to get that done. But the Chinese customers, contractors need productivity too. And that's where our business model is so important. I think we'll let you each ask one more question if that's okay. I know we're getting close to time. so. Uh, you, you t and your to-do list for things you're still wanting to uh, get better on, uh, one thing you mentioned was a need for more employee engagement. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? Well, we continually work at this, and we have, it's a lot like dealer uh, variability. We have some plants, some offices. Uh, our, our, as Ed mentioned, our Chinese engaged employees are very high. We have other areas that are not so high. And what our goal is, we've identified, is we really want to push that up so that when people come to work they recommend cat to work to their friends and their family and that's one of the key questions we use in our <coughs> surveys and would you recommend caterpillar as a place to work and we want more people to say yes and how, we'll how, never how get you, there how are you trying to get there well through the first line supervisor in the office or the shop to try to create an environment which is much more conducive to employee input employee involvement uh, certainly the CP uh, cap production system and now our lean um, efforts with a lead person in the shop floor where they feel a lot more engaged and in charge of what they're doing every day is helpful. Uh, you see a lot of this in the automotive industry and that's what we're trying to replicate out, uh, in quicker than we have been. So we, we just want to move that, we want to move the whole bar up, but we want to improve the variability among different units as well. And this applies all over the world. It's not just in the U.S. or in Europe. Certainly, we now in Europe, there's a lot of consternation with our restructuring. As soon as we get that done, we'll work on engagement there and, and improve that. 
Could I ask you, uh, we're here at the show, obviously a lot of Tier 4 final equipment on your stand. This is, uh, has been a big thing for the industry, but what about your R&D after the Tier 4 mm -hmm. phase? Mm -hmm. What will be the emphasis for you? Is it still mm -hmm. going to be fuel economy? You've got that great hybrid on the stand. Yeah. Yeah. Where are you going to go Yes next? and yes and yes. <laughs> uh, we've, we've, had, yeah, we've had this, this uh, tremendous weight on our shoulders of emissions, and this goes back to the mid-90s and tier two, three, four, all the way through now to the end of 14, we'll essentially, will be 80, 90% through tier four. That's going to free up tens of billions of dollars in the industry and certainly billions of dollars over the next five years here to invest in other things like maybe more fuel economy, certainly a lot more in technology. And that, I, I see technology is drawing a tremendous amount of our investment going forward. How do you, how do you cross the, the uh, ground one less pass. Mm -hmm. How do you? How do we? When when a when a government or a, or a uh, an owner lets a bid, they let it digitally. How do we make sure that it goes right through to the blade of that machine to know how much cubic yards or meters that needs to move, running eight hours a day with no downtime, and then how do we prevent repairs? so that we, we anticipate when a failure occurs. And there's tremendous opportunity with that, yeah. tremendous down the road. I, I think you ought to think about it from a customer perspective. <clears throat> we talk a lot about how do we get to the point where he makes more money with our products and services versus any competitor. And if you think about the drivers, it's the productivity of getting the work done with fewer passes and the other things. It's driving improvement, fuel efficiency, which takes that cost down. And the other one that we're spending a lot of money in in the R&D space is how do you make an average operator a great operator? How do, you, how do you get a guy in a seat and through the visual detections that he has, he knows what to do and where to do it? And if you can increase operator productivity in that regard, I think once again, you know, our customers make more money. And if they make more money with our equipment, this, uh, this gets pretty easy. So that's going to be the focus. Here's the last question. And I'll give it short. <laughs> if, if she's the boss. Yeah, that's going to be the focus of your... You only uh, get one. Your, uh, yeah, it will only be one. Uh, R&D spending. And that's going to be the focus of your R&D spending. Can you, can you just give us a little more detail on what is going to be the focus of your M&A spending? You said there's no big deals in the in the pipeline right now. You didn't really think that, that, that the, the, the concatenation we saw of them a few years back was just that kind of, you yeah. know, just a one-off kind of thing. Yeah. Billions of dollars are going to be out there as a result of Tier 4 being behind you. It doesn't sound like you're going to be funneling a whole lot of that towards M&A. What, what, yeah. That's what I heard. What yeah. is the focus going to be? And is technology, I didn't hear you mention technology as one of the focuses yeah. of M&A. Could, could it be in the future? Yeah. The, any M&A activity we have will be, I think, around the edges, kind of traditionally as we've done up until 2010-11. And we always have, every day we have probably 15 or 20 active things we're looking at, but all very small. Take the Berg acquisition last year, which was a marine propulsion kind of end-to-end -end, uh, business for, for uh, locking in our engine right down to the propeller. I, we might see more of that, but I, we, we don't have anything big out there right now that we could, we could go after. Most of our time and our R&D are our investment will be around capturing that 918 billion, getting lean to work. That won't come with a high degree of cost because it's an immediate payoff, but we'll be forcing those to come through to, to increase our return. But I just don't see, I see organic growth opportunities so great in the structures and businesses we have that that's going to drive a lot of volume. And then we may find some small bolt-ons that we would we would do from time to time, as we have done. In those three areas you mentioned? Well, uh, primarily. Uh, oil, oil and gas. gas mining and, and electric power. Still have an appetite for mining acquisitions. That, 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 that um, Well, I look at mining. Me. Yeah, I'm sure. I, I look at mining as, a, again, a 10, 20, 40-year business. I don't see another big acquisition at all, but there are some things that we could certainly add on that we're looking at that would help our mining uh, portfolio and our leaders, but it would be small. I it mean, be small. We, we have a 90% coverage yeah. of the products already, so there's not yeah. a big scope. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that there's not. Yeah. Yeah.